brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that sends 5% of your monthly plan price to your favorite charity. No contracts, nationwide coverage, risk-free guarantee. Learn more at CharityMobile.com. Good morning on a Saturday. I have for you something educational today, but is also of interesting historic relevance. It is Archbishop Lefebvre giving a informal address in Trent in 1979. Had never been translated before. The good folks at Rorate Chaley have a translation for it, and I will direct you to their website to read it. And in my show notes today at returntotradition.org, I have a link directly to it. If you don't read Rorate Chaley, at least on occasion, you should do so. They do good work there. Anyway, he gives you an idea of what the fathers of the Council of Trent would have thought of Vatican II and of the crew of people running Rome in his time and in ours. It's uh, not pleasant. He doesn't have terribly nice things to say. He reminds us that it is our duty to resist them. Again, some, of course, take umbrage. How can you resist lawful authorities in the church? Well, he says that most of them are modernists and thus are not even really Catholic. And we have a duty to resist them. We have a duty to preserve the faith inviolate, whole, and intact that our souls depend on it. Then he gives us in a very laid-back kind of address. It's interesting because I, this is not the first time I've had something from Archbishop Lefebvre on a Saturday morning for you. This might be the most relaxed of his talks, and in the same time, it's also potentially the most hard-hitting. So here's Archbishop Lefebvre, what the Council Fathers of Trent would have thought of Vatican II. The Second Vatican Council. What would the fathers of the Council of Trent say about it? Seeing the present state of the church is a cause of great grief to us, and I am sure it is the same for all of you. How can it be that we have received official documents from Rome that are not in favor of the Catholic religion, that do not go along with the tradition and the Catholic faith? The answer is easy. The church has been taken over. Yes, it has been taken over, taken over by modernists, who defend their errors condemned by Pius X, who said, the enemy is now inside the church. It is no longer on the outside. It is inside the church. This enemy is found in the seminaries. In these seminaries, the enemy of the church will become a priest, a bishop, a cardinal, with ideas that are not Catholic but modernist, laden with naturalism, rationalism, evolutionism, and relativism in doctrine and morality. This is modernism. Men with these ideas became bishops and cardinals. Then the Second Vatican Council was ushered in, and the modernists wanted to have this council to spread their ideas. And they held this council with weak popes. Pope John XXIII was not a very strong man, and even if he was a traditionalist at heart, he didn't want to give the impression of not being up to date with modern ideas. Under the influence of these cardinals, he opened the council, and in my opinion, the poor pope passed away of grief when he saw where the council was heading. That was my impression, anyway. I knew Pope John well when he was Monsignor Roncalli in Paris, where as apostolic delegate in Africa, I went to see him many times. We spoke a lot. He had the heart of a traditionalist, and when he saw how this council was ruining the church, it is said he uttered before he died, stop the council, stop the council. Regrettably, the modernists who took over the church are still there, and have driven out all the traditionalists, and now every great city in the world has a modernist bishop as cardinal. Milan, Madrid, Amsterdam, Paris, and Chicago. When Monsignor Bernadin, the newly appointed Cardinal of Chicago, was Bishop of Cincinnati, he was involved in a pacifist campaign and led a peace march. Subsequently, he was made Archbishop of Chicago. When I visited Chicago, sometime before the actual appointment, I read in the newspapers that the press was not in favor of the bishop becoming Archbishop of Chicago, the second most important city in America. This was the opinion of both the left and right-wing newspapers. In short, all the newspapers. And what happened? Monsignor Bernadin was duly nominated Archbishop of Chicago. How can this be accounted for? There was someone behind it all. One of the modernist cardinals in Rome. Casseroli, Baggio, Peronio, Poletti. They are all modernists. In the past, the modernists and the liberals were driven out of the church by Pius IX, Leo XIII, and St. Pius X. Popes always drove out the liberals and the modernists because they were against the good of the church. But even the popes in their encyclicals slowly but surely admitted, we have condemned them, we have done everything in our power to stop them having influence in the church, but nobody is listening to us, nobody is obeying us. The popes wrote in this, their encyclicals that this error of modernism was becoming increasingly more organized, increasingly stronger. 
Then the Second Vatican Council came along and the modernists took advantage of it to seize power in the Vatican. Now they tell me, you are being disobedient. For sure I am disobedient to modernism, and since they are modernists I do not want to obey them. I want to obey Catholics while well, they want to wreck the church, and I want no part of that. I want to build the church, not demolish it. Paul VI himself said, it is the auto-demolition of the church. Who is demolishing the church? Somebody is certainly doing it. The church cannot demolish by herself. These men are doing it. For this reason I have said that there are different Romes, and at present there is a modernist Rome which is the most powerful. Let us pray, hope, and make sacrifice, asking God to make these men leave. They really are not good Catholics. They really are not true churchmen. There are others who are good and want the best for the church, but are hindered because the modernists are stronger. These men have been busy organizing themselves for 15 years and have all the power now. Even the Pope can't do anything. They say to the Pope, you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that. They are powerful and present in all of the offices, all over Rome. When I went for an audience with Pope Paul VI, I didn't go through Cardinal Velo, who at the time had all the power as Secretary of State. Indeed, he had enforced regulations where nobody in the Curia could make a move without his permission. He was more powerful than the Pope, and he didn't want me to see the pontiff. Afterwards, I understood why. He had spoken calumnies against me to the Pope. He had told him, This Bishop Monsignor Lefebvre makes his seminary and signs statements against you, against the Pope. Paul VI had replied, This seems impossible to me, that a bishop would make his seminary and sign something against the Pope. Then Cardinal Villot asked for permission to take action against the seminary, against all of my work. The Pope said, Certainly, you must follow what's happening at the seminary, and this work must disappear. It must not continue. Consequently, Villot cooked up a scheme against my seminary, a false scheme, also against canon law, and he was sure that after four months the Acon Seminary would have been closed and all the seminarians sent back home. When I found out about all this, I refused to accept it. Subsequently, when I went to see Pope Paul VI, Cardinal Villot only knew about it a couple of hours beforehand, and he sent Cardinal Bernelli saying, You must go with Monsignor Lefebvre to the audience of the Pope. And he came. Who knows whether he came to keep an eye on me or the Pope, as he never said a word during the meeting, but only took notes. At first, the Pope was upset and angry. It is not true that you have great respect for the Pope because you make your seminary and sign statements against the Pope. I responded, Would I be able to do such a thing? I have been a servant of the Pope all my life. If it is true, let me see a copy of these statements. The Pope looked at me, then he softened and was kinder. The cause of his anger had been the calumny by Cardinal Villot. It was an incredible lie, but that's what happened. These people are not churchmen. Velo is not a churchman. Baggio is not a churchman. Casaroli is not a churchman. They are not churchmen because their principles are not the principles of the church. So we are being targeted because we want to maintain the tradition while they no longer want it and say, if the Pope gives permission for the traditionalists to have the Mass of St. Pius V, everything we have done after the Council is gone. It is over. The present Pope does not agree with this. In fact, he would be disposed to allowing the old Mass. Pope John Paul II said to me during an audience that it was ridiculous. This Mass that we ourselves have celebrated for many years, the Mass of the Church, why prohibit it? Then Cardinal Sepper, Prefect for the Congregation of the Faith, stepped in saying to the Pope, No, no, Holiness, don't give this faculty to Monsignor Lefebvre because he will make a banner of it. A banner? The Mass is the Mass I have always celebrated, and it is a banner, in the sense that it is the cross of Jesus Christ. For me, it is the banner of Catholicism. It is the cross, but it is not a banner in the sense to go to war with. Well, the Pope was then perplexed and did nothing, but he had been disposed to signing. This is the situation in Rome, and all of you must know about it, because if you don't, you might think that all goes well in Rome, that everything coming from Rome is holy in accordance with Catholic tradition, that all is well and there is nothing bad there, that Rome is holy. Honestly, it is not that way anymore. Not now. There was a time it was like that. When I was in the Roman seminary, and then when I was apostolic delegate to go to all the Roman congregations and to the Secretary of State, I met Cardinal Tardini, for example. Now, there was a true churchman. Also, I knew Cardinal Ottaviani, Cardinal Brown, and Cardinal Antoine, all of whom were real churchmen, who gave everything to the church, and nothing else, nothing to politics. Not the men now, though. There are still some good men, but the ones that have all the power. When they took power in Rome, they changed everything. The, letter, the liturgy, the seminaries, the theology, the morality, leaving all of it to liberty. And with liberty, things fall apart. These people have real animosity for traditionalists. Real hate. Everyone is now welcome in the Vatican. Members of other, including hostile religions, the international stonecutters, 
and all the revolutionaries, but not Catholics. We are Catholics and we cannot have an audience with the Pope. Once at a conference held in France, I said, perhaps a day will come when the devil will ask to be received in the Vatican. And they will say to him, you are a very cultured person, very intelligent and powerful, and we have these human rights. So we are obliged to receive you. On the other hand, we know that you are in a somewhat difficult situation, which we still don't know how long will last. But who knows? Perhaps one day God. And we also know that you have had some difficulty with Jesus Christ and the Holy Virgin, but perhaps a responsibility lies on both sides. Perhaps. This is the situation now. For the church, each has is to his own responsibility. And so their mea culpas, their mea culpas for the sins of the church to the Protestants, and so on. The church made mistakes, so even now the demon will be welcomed. We, on the other hand, cannot have an audience. The situation in Rome is extremely serious, and we must pray. We must pray especially to the Blessed Virgin, since she is the strongest against the demon. She is always in battle with the demon and with those who do not want the kingdom of her son. The Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception, holds only one name in her heart, Jesus. Only one name in her thoughts, Jesus. We too must do what we can to be like her, to have only one name in our hearts and thoughts, the name of Jesus. The reign of Jesus for all men, the eternal kingdom for all men, all of them. The reign of beatitude, joy, peace, and eternity our final destination at the end of our earthly life. We need to pray about this difficult situation in the church. We need to pray like the little children of Fatima did. They were shown a vision of hell by Our Lady, into which souls fall like leaves from trees in autumn. We need to pray and do penance, asking with all our hearts to the, for the capacity to pray, getting the children to pray, pleading with God to change the situation, for the salvation of our souls and the souls of all people. So I'm curious what you thought of that. What did you think of his characterization of things, about how there are two Romes, essentially. There's the modernist Rome, and he didn't name it, but his frequent other go-to description is eternal Rome, and that is the Rome of the Catholic faith. That is a sort of an abstract concept. The, you know, wherever people are keeping the true faith, whatever priests and bishops are keeping the true faith, whatever laity are, there lies eternal Rome. It's an interesting idea. I'm sure there are some people who will have problems with it, he, you know, famously would tussle in the 1980s and if, into the early 1990s before his own passing away with then Cardinal Ratzinger on the issues of the social reign of Christ the King, to which reportedly, according to Lefebvre, Ratzinger didn't even understand the traditional teaching of the social reign of Christ the King. Perhaps later on, Ratzinger, especially as Pope Benedict, maybe he changed his mind on that issue. I don't know. Maybe... If you are aware, let me know. I'm curious. But he would, you know, go to his grave defending the faith. On paper, he was excommunicated. It was almost certainly an invalid, unjust excommunication because you cannot be excommunicated. You're just trying to keep the same faith as always. That's my hot take. Maybe you disagree. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this. And uh, hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So to share this on social media, it helps too. Go visit Rorate Chaley's blog, please. It's uh, They do good work over there. A lot of good edifying reading. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.